That's all I've got as far as housekeeping. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Jack Buckskin. Jack is a trailblazer for the relationship and uh, sorry for the reclamation and revitalisation of the Ghana language. He's a Ghana and Narunga man who is the founder of the performing arts company Kumar Karu. I don't know if I got that right, Jack, but close. Um, and he's also a coordinator and educator at Townley College. So please join me in welcoming Jack to give welcome to country. Thank you. I'll come and stand at the front here. Uh, firstly, I just want to say Happy New Year to you all. It's, uh, it's my first day back to work today, so thank you very much for having me here. I'm still in holiday mode and I will be shooting off straight after this to go back and join my holiday mode for the weekend. Um, but uh, those that don't know me, my name is, is Jack. Um, my mum didn't give me the name Jack, she actually gave me the name Vincent and I didn't find out my name was Jack until I, um, I didn't find out my name was Vincent until I started school because my whole family called me Jack. Um, Jack's easier for you to remember because my Aboriginal name is Ganyapundunduit Pinakudnuitja. I don't like people calling me Vincent. My mum's brother's name's Vincent and my mum's brother, uh, back in 2011, I uh, won South, Young South Australian of the Year and my mum's brother was like, yeah, I'm Vincent, he's getting all the emails, so he tried to claim um, my name, so I, n I never use it. Um, I never used it that much that I actually gave it to my son because it was like a brand new tyre that hadn't been used. So my young son's now Vincent as well, poor bloke, uh, because my uncle will tell you that he's the, the real Vincent. Um, I represent three different Aboriginal groups, the Garan of the Adelaide Plains here, Narunga from the York Peninsula, Wurrungal from Streaky Bay, Sajuna area, but also acknowledge my father who's uh, Italian Scottish. Um, I, I do I take every opportunity I can to speak in language, so w when I get the opportunity I will translate in language as I'm the first person in my family to be able to speak publicly uh, and to educate others around as well. So, I'll do take the honour of, uh, on behalf of Ghana people, getting the opportunity to welcome you all onto country. It's a protocol for us to, to welcome our guests onto country. And uh, as part of that, it's about acknowledging the spiritual ancestors of the lands that we, that we meet on and that we all come as friends. So we acknowledge the spiritual ancestors of this land. I'd acknowledge them and let them know that everybody that comes here as guests from afar uh, come as friends. And whether we live in, in the Adelaide Plains area, um, we actually come from different lands. I, I come from the, uh, a place called Muliaki, which is uh, about 30 k's uh, north of the city of Adelaide. And travelling into the city of Adelaide across three different lands, so even within the Ghana people we have different lands. And I'm a visitor to the CB CBD area, so I acknowledge uh, on behalf of all of us that spiritual connection and the spiritual relationships of the elders that live within this country that help guide all of us when we travel on lands. People ask why do we do welcome the countries because, and, and the best way I can explain it is that we believe in multiple worlds. As, as Aboriginal people believe in multiple worlds, which is the sky world, the spiritual world that lives harmoniously uh, uh, with our physical world. Now the physical world, we all see it, so we believe it. But uh, the spiritual world, the sky world, which is one, um, it's a bit like Pokemon Go. For those that had kids and grandkids, it's a, it's a, it's a world <laughs> hidden within our world. And, and with the right skills and technique, you can access the, the spiritual world. And, and we, as human beings, we all have this, um, this, this inner energy about ourselves. We're all energies, even as people, but this inner energy in the spiritual world is part of that energy that we, we all connect with ourselves. And, and I encourage people to, to continue to connect with yourself because when you connect with yourself, you connect with your environment. We're all, we're all ourselves. Biggest, biggest tip for Aboriginal culture, togetherness and oneness. We never do anything on our own. 
we always do things together and, and I love coming to conferences because it's where people come together to make decisions and that's what our culture is all about. But the, the oneness is that none of us are more superior than anybody that stands alongside of us because we all have our own responsibilities. My Aboriginal name, Ganyapundunduit Pinakudna, which uh, what it does is it tells you my responsibility and where I fit in my family. Ganya, it's my individual totem, which is, it means the rock. Um, it's my duty to care for the life and the habitats of the rock. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's easier when it's a plant and an animal. My nephew, he's a wombat, um, so it's his duty to care for those. He's not allowed to eat them. My children, my youngest, my oldest daughter is Gulyul, the black swan. So the life and the habitat around our country, where, the, where all our good little, where all the black swans live, they, uh, it's her duty to care for that part of the country. My second born son, Vincent, now is uh, his nuku, which is the owl. And my youngest is Pundundul, the dragonfly. So um, my name then went from Ganya on its own to Ganya Pundundul, the father of the dragonfly, to help my youngest understand his responsibility. And uh, good news, you tells you I'm the third born male in my family. So each of us, our individual totem is our responsibility to care for it. And without anybody else, we, we won't be able to, that, that sustainability of that uh, plant, animal, or element, whatever it is, um, is, is going to be neglected. So when we talk about understanding our spiritual connection to place and country and talking about our inner selves, we connect ourselves with the spiritual world and sometimes don't even realise it. First way that Aboriginal people can access the spiritual world is through scent, all right, through smell. And a lot of us would have this, these, these opportunities that arise from us. Uh, you know, when you, you have a certain grandmother or a, um, or a mother or somebody that has this certain perfume or odour and they pass away and then many years later you're walking down the street and you cop a whiff of that smell. Ever happened to anybody? Now, that's, uh, for us as, as people, the, the, the way we welcome our guests and acknowledge that guest uh, or acknowledge our guests on an individual level if you came into my country, my country I'll rub my sweat onto you because we all come with a certain smell about ourselves you notice that you'll you'll borrow a French jumper you smell them and you go to the house and you realize the whole family have the same smell so when we're talking about the spiritual connection and why we'll why that happens when we smell that old person that might have passed away or a younger person whatever um, it's because it's unique to us by rubbing our sweat onto you, you become part of our family. So the spiritual world amongst you live and look after you. Now, I'm not, uh, there's too many of you to rub my sweat on. and it's, it's, Even though it's summer, it's not that warm outside. So I'll, I'll leave you with that one. But uh, I, I, I speak you into country. The other way of, uh, the next way from, uh, from smelling and being a part of the spiritual world through scent is, is through feeling. When you feel to, when you feel at a place where you're at home, or you can get to a place, even if it's a, a, a nice lecture theatre like this, and you feel your hairs tingle, and you know it feels like a place you're not supposed to be, you start to feel, and then you start to see, and communicate comes next. And and I was always sceptical as a kid because you know with the, we had always had family that goes, oh, your grandmother's over in the corner, and she'd been passed away for many many years, and we go, you know, she's not. And we thought the old people were crazy. We're like, no, nah, there's nobody there. You're crazy. Uh, and then when you eventually grow and all these things happen, you go, okay, maybe you're not crazy. We just haven't learnt yet. And, and we, we encourage people to say, and that's why I say I encourage people to get in touch with oneself because by getting in touch with oneself, you get in touch with the energies of everything else around us because we're all energies. So I do um, acknowledge and thank you for allowing me to come and welcome you on the country. Half of our people welcome. Uh, for those that come from afar, so those that have come from afar, welcome to Adelaide. Adelaide's original name is known as Tarndanya. Now, Tarndanya is the short form of saying Tarndaganya, which is the dreaming place of the big red kangaroo. Um, the old stories of, of the Tarnda, who was the, the red kangaroo, uh, travelled from this lands and travelled right across the lands and gave us what it is our, our law system. Um, and, and it started here in the city of Adelaide. So um, next time you come back, for those that are from overseas or interstate, hand up. Sweet. Now I'm going to get you to follow me, yeah? You're going to say this. Tarndanya. Now the locals, I want you to say Tarndanya. Yeah, a little bit outnumbered. Try the, lo the, the interstate or internationals again. Tarndanya. Now next time you come back to Adelaide, you're going to be coming back to... Very good, everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Enjoy. You ain't your wonder and nothing up. I need to use more. We're going to stick around. I'm shooting off. Thank you.
leave that one. <laughs> Don't try this one. We're really loud, aren't we? Are we too loud? No, all right. <laughs> well, that's going to work. I can barely hold it together, seeing so many of you here. Um, this was a crazy idea that... Well, you can tell I can barely hold it together. This is a crazy idea that uh, I had. I can't remember how long ago now. Um, I suppose somewhere near the beginning of this year, I suggested to a couple of mates, one of whom is Phil Lorne, who you'll hear from later on today and again tomorrow, and another one of whom is Gabrielle Bond, who has done, in her spare time, without a cent of payment, hundreds of hours to make this happen. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, I, I'm not going to talk to you for very long. Some of you from Adelaide have been to talks I've given in the past um, on economics on various issues. I'm not going to talk very much about economics at all. I'm going to very soon pass, uh, pass the baton on to um, one of the people I think is one of the greatest economists in the world. I'm not going to introduce him myself. Uh, I'm going to allow a family member of his to, to introduce him. Um, we have some brilliant economists and others to engage with us over the next three days, and I'm immensely grateful to them. I'm also immensely grateful that we have with us, uh, uh, the, if, if, I'm, if it's all right to say this, I hope he doesn't mind, the greatest living Australian economist, and um, certainly the, the greatest one from Adelaide, which is Geoffrey Harcourt, who's sitting in front of us at the moment here. I'd like to thank all the volunteers, and of course, especially Gabby. Um, but most of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'm really very grateful and, 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 and overwhelmed. If you are from interstate or overseas, uh, you're in Adelaide at a, obviously a very unusual and, and dreadful time for Australia as a whole, but it's incredibly unusual in the sense that when you get a southerly wind in Adelaide, we normally have the cleanest air in the world. I used to commute from here to London and back, and I'd get home, and I'd, uh, having polluted my lungs uh, with uh, London rush hour air for uh, months at a time, I'd breathe in a deep breath as soon as I got back to Adelaide. You must have noticed outside, now I guess if you're from Sydney, as, as some of you are, you're used to this, but it's really only come in in the last couple of days with a change in the wind. You must have noticed outside the smoke and what you're breathing in out there, and again, I'm going to lose it now, is um, the destruction of Kangaroo Island. The jewel in the crown for this state, ecologically speaking. One of the jewels in the crown for this whole country uh, is burning at the moment. Um, there's all sorts of statistics I could throw at you more than half the population of koalas on that island have gone and, and, and uh, if, as seems likely, we're going to have events like this or events that are more severe than this more frequently in the future, it may never recover. So surely now, and I've got some slides but I might not even use them, we'll see. Surely at this point in history, right now, is the right moment for us to try and shift the national conversation in this country, isn't it? Yeah. It's time to rethink our attitude as a nation, not just to climate breakdown, but to ecological sustainability more generally. But we have to go further than that. We have to rethink our attitude to to social justice, to all the social injustices that have been done in this country over a long, not just in this country either, internationally over a long period of time, and to our whole approach to managing our economy. And that's what this conference 
is all about. So I've uh, asked the leading, the leading macroeconomists in the world, and if you're not a modern monetary theorist, then I won't be calling you uh, one of the leading macroeconomists in the world. And they couldn't all come, but we've done pretty well, really. We've got Professor William Mitchell, who was the person that I was mentioning before. Later on this afternoon, you're going to meet Professor Stephanie Kelton. Um, Warren Mosler also has been very supportive of the conference, and I know that uh, Bill is going to be playing part of a conversation that he had recently with uh, Warren, and you'll be able to go online later and watch the whole conversation if you haven't done that already. Uh, we have Robert Costanza from ANU, who is one of the world's leading ecological economists, taking part in this, in this conference, and I know that's important to, to, to a lot of you. It's important to me as well. We have a video interview, edited very inexpertly by me, but remember I'm an amateur. Be nice to me. At least I'm an amateur where these things are concerned, but we'll do the best we can. We have a, we have a, 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 a videoed interview with Herman Daly. Now, just as Bill is one of the people that you might say invented or developed modern monetary theory, Herman Daly is one of the people who you might say developed or invented ecological economics all those years ago. These really are the most important names in their field and we need to listen to them all and to engage with them all, but not just them either. We've got, um, I, I, there are many other speakers. I'm not going to start listing them because I'll start missing people out um, if, I, if I do that. Maybe I will just flick through a slide or two. Thanks, Coco. Uh, that's the name of the conference. Oh, yeah. Um, we've done this with no funding. We've not taken any money from anyone, except, of course, we've had some funding because you've all been kind enough to contribute towards the cost of the conference. Paul was quite right. Uh, I was going to say some of the things he said, but he says them much better than me. Um, we, we do have a, a slight deficit because I didn't think we'd get more than 100 people, really, and we thought, OK, we'll take a small loss to have a conference with 100 people because we didn't want people who were uh, on low incomes or unemployed not to be able to come. Uh, and, and we do need to feed you uh, during the conference. The university has given us the room uh, for nothing. Oh, one thing I should say, uh, I, I would like to add what Paul said. If, as I know, there are one or two people, this is true of, if you're diabetic, then please just ignore we, what we said about not bringing food into the room. That's absolutely fair. Uh, and good, uh, but for, as far as the rest of us, um, as far as the rest of us are concerned, uh, my book's not about a Green New Deal, and uh, it's not the world's greatest book ever. But there are copies of it available. You could buy outside. Any proceeds from that will, and this was the point of, of the sentence I started some time ago. Any proceeds that we get from that will go towards reducing the losses on the conference, that would be absolutely, uh, absolutely great. If anybody wants me to sign one, I'm quite happy to do that as well. Um, I said on the slides, this conference is about tipping points, and it's about challenges. Now, we can get very depressed if we dwell on ecological tipping points all the time. So I'm not talking about that kind of tipping point here. I'm talking about a tipping point, as I said before, in the national narrative. And our challenge, our challenge is to force them to listen. Look at how many of us are here. Our challenge is to force the politicians to take climate breakdown seriously and to take inequality seriously and to take full employment seriously. Um, and this conference is an attempt by a pair of amateurs, basically Gabby and me, to push the narrative at least slightly. So please enjoy the next few days. Take from them whatever you can. That photo on the left is a picture out of my bedroom window. I live in the Adelaide Hills. Anyone else live in the Adelaide Hills here? Do you feel like me? You're not sure whether it's going to be safe in the future? And of course, we give our condolences to those people, there might be some people in this room, this is true, of, who've lost their homes in the fires that we've had in the Adelaide Hills already this summer, and it's only January. Uh, I couldn't help looking out of the window, looking at my pet koala, going up and down one of the trees, and thinking about Kangaroo 
Ireland and, and thinking about that wonderful ecological resource which is just being frittered away at the moment. And yeah, I've been on climate protests. I didn't make the banner. Somebody else kindly did that for me. She might be in this room. But I've been on climate protests and I've listened to young people giving great, inspiring speeches full of anguish and anger. And actually that made me, that was one of the things that made me think about having this conference too because I wanted to empower them. I wanted to empower myself because there's lots that I'm going to learn over the next few days. The more we know, the more empowered we, we are, the more we are in a position not just to protest, as people will be outside Parliament House, quite rightly, this afternoon, but actually to suggest an alternative to the way in which we are operating our economy and we are ignoring our ecosystem, which will resonate with people and which might actually lead to some politicians at some point in the foreseeable future in this country being elected to power and doing something about it. I mean, they ought to think about changing their attitude, shouldn't they? Because, of course, that's Canberra, that's Parliament House in the background behind that BBC reporter recently. Why should we be leading the world in the fight against climate breakdown? Of course we should. Morality is the first reason. What do I mean by morality? Amongst all the OECD countries, we have the highest carbon emissions per capita, the highest per capita of any of the rich countries in the world in the OECD club. And that's before you take our fossil fuels exports into account. That's based on what we consume, basically, not, not, not what we produce. Threats. We're under more threat from climate breakdown, clearly, than many countries around the world. So it's in our narrow self-interest to adopt a different approach to thinking about these issues. And opportunities too, as everybody knows. We've got immense opportunities to move, sh to move quickly towards uh, renewable energy and then away, away from a reliance on fossil fuels to power our economy. If we can't do it in Australia, then who can do it? Um, we know the sorts of things that we need to plan for. Sustainable energy, land use, transportation. Well, I won't read them all. They're obvious, really, when you think about it, and we're not doing very much of any of those things. But when we're talking about um, uh, uh, social justice, then there are other issues which are also important. Um, eliminating uh, involuntary unemployment with all the consequences of that, that, that go with it, particularly for young people. Inequality has been rising in Australia, inexorably really, since about 1974 when there was, that happened to be the last year when there was full employment in Australia. Um, I walk by uh, homeless guys on Rundle Street, maybe you do, a couple of them that I know. Um, why in a country like Australia is housing not a right? Uh, excellent public services, economic security for all, why don't we do that? Why don't we do all that stuff? It's because we've fallen for an economic narrative which is based on myths. Myths which serve the interests of uh, particular interest groups in our society, myths which form the basis of what people sometimes call neoliberalism or what one of the authors I'm going to interview tomorrow morning, Cameron Murray, has called a game of mates, the big game of mates in Australia where wealth is sucked from the bottom up to the top. Um, that economist is a gentleman, actually a, a, a friend of uh, uh, Jeff Harcourt, um, called Hyman Minsky. Uh, uh, Minsky died in 1990. Six, uh, in, a, in a book he published in 1986, he was a good one for quotes. Um, that quote leapt off the page at me the first time I read it. The game of policy making is rigged. The print is constrained by the theory of intellectuals. Yes, if you are on the conservative side of politics, actually, the, let me use the word, neoclassical frame for thinking about economic policy serves your interest. You're naturally going to um, choose that approach. But 
a tragedy in my view is that people on the progressive side of politics, not just in Australia but around the world, have used the same advisors basically, used the same approach to thinking about economics and economic management for 30 years, 40 years. And they've been constrained. Basically they've used the approach to um, thinking about the economy and uh, uh, describing uh, economic options which the Conservatives have used and that's why they've lost a lot of the time and even when they've won, kind of, they've lost because they've not been able to make the changes that we need to make when they're in power because they've been constrained by the theory of their intellectuals, you might say. Um, the guy on the right is in the video with Bill that you're going to see in a moment. Warren Mosler, that's not from something he wrote, I don't think. I think it was from an interview. I heard him give. The progressives. Lack of understanding of the monetary system has been the worst enemy of the progressive agenda. This is, I think, what Bill Mitchell will be talking to us about in a few minutes, or at least it's related to it, because we need to rethink the role of the government in our economy, in economic management, in moving towards a future of, yes, sustainable prosperity, ecological sustainability and social justice and that means we need to think much more carefully about the appropriate role for the government budget for the federal government budget for the fiscal balance in economic management that's something we're going to be talking about actually sometimes politicians say things which if you just were to take them a little bit out of context would make sense even though the politicians perhaps don't make all that much sense themselves most of the time and don't even understand what they're saying sometimes. Mr Morrison, a couple of days ago on the ABC News when of course talking about the bushfires claimed the surplus is of no focus to me will make every investment that needs to be made. <laughs> Imagine if he said that under other circumstances in a different context because actually it's the right thing to say. I don't, I don't want to start getting into Bill Mitchell's talk, so I'll let him explain that. I'm not going to explain that. Um, I will say, and don't get me wrong, listen very carefully to when Professor Mitchell is, is speaking, but our government with our monetary system genuinely cannot run out of money. It cannot run out of its own currency. There are, once you understand this, it's not a recipe for limitless but it does make you completely rethink economic management and how our economy ought to be organised and how you might want to go about planning for a just transition or a Green New Deal or whatever else you want to call it, a rose by any other name and all that. Um, if it isn't about the money, what is it all about? I'll let somebody else answer that question. If Scott Morrison, well if someone wanted to start planning for a future of ecological sustainability and social justice, where should he start? Sorry about the typo. That was the question that I wanted this conference to be about. And I don't need to go through all this stuff really because Paul already did. But you're going to hear some things, you're probably going to hear some things during this conference which don't match up to your preconceptions sometimes or which seem a little bit counterintuitive. But we're all we all have stuff to learn. Uh, we're all wrong sometimes. I'm wrong a lot of the time. So if we can leave our preconceptions at the door, if, you, if we can not jump to um, conclusions about what uh, a, a particular speaker is saying, without just taking a while to step back and think about things carefully, rather than just relying on instinct. Um, yes, Paul said, if we can show courtesy and respect for all, of course. I hope we're all going to have some new thoughts over the next three days. Uh, 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 I hope I'm going to have some new thoughts over the next few days. I hope we're going to build new connections. Connections between different thoughts or different issues. Um, I hope that we're going to build some bridges. Um, and I hope that you're going to feel infused, empowered, you're going to want to find out more. When I say join the team, join a team anyway, whether we're talking about ecological justice, social justice, 
whether you want to join or form a Modern Money Australia group in Adelaide or elsewhere in the country. I hope we're going to engage. There is going to be a little bit of education. Um, but I hope it's going to be fun. I hope you're going to be entertained. Uh, I hope we're going to feel some enlightenment. I hope everybody is going to go away enthusiastic to meet the challenge. Because there's no point just thinking, let's fiddle while Rome burns. Let's just ignore um, the situation that exists at the moment and let's ignore the changes that have to happen in economics as a discipline as well. I hope you're going to feel empowered. And here we go. I would like to apologise in advance. Um, as and when it doesn't all run smoothly, please bear in mind, this has been organised largely by two people. I'm one of them. But the dynamo, as some of you know, the amazing dynamo that's Gabrielle Bond, the queen of organising, has really made all this possible. So having said that, and thank you again for listening to me, I would like to pass the baton on now to Jane Flanagan to introduce Bill Mitchell. Still being recorded at the moment, but I will oh, right. But it, but it went about 40, 40. It didn't go over time, did it, mate? Did no, I it was fine. It was fine.